Okay, so welcome to lecture 8.2 of our group theory course. This is the second lecture of chapter 8, and uh, we are going to continue our discussion on the um, group applications of group theory to the um, uh, vibrational properties of molecules. <coughs> and uh, we start today's lecture by uh, introducing uh, the Raman effect and uh, and the implications of uh, uh, Raman effect uh, implications of group theory to, to the Raman effect in terms of analyzing uh, selection rules for Raman effect. So the Raman effect is the inelastic scattering of light from either molecules or, or solids and uh, you, you shine light into a molecule and uh, the molecule can scatter the photon by uh, absorbing or emitting a, a quantum of vibration in the case of a solid it we call it phono all right so and uh, the key uh, uh, quantity to analyze the, the raman effect is the dipole moment and the polarization of the molecule. So this is the induced dipole moment of the molecule when you shine light with a certain uh, uh, frequency omega. So EI is the incident radiation, is the incident electric field, and alpha is the polariz polarizability of the molecule. So it's, it's also called the Raman polarizability. So this is uh, this is the polarizability. And this is the incident electric field of the light. And uh, so uh, what happens is that uh, you usually have either in, uh, in uh, a molecular vibrations that, uh, um, I mean, your molecule is maybe in an excited molecular mode or you can uh, excite uh, using light, the, your system to a certain vibrational mode. And when you have a, a vibrational state this can be in higher order, this can induce changes in the polarizability. So you can write these changes in, in polarizability uh, induced by vibrations like that. So this is the, 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 the original polarizability and this is the change in polarizability delta alpha uh, and uh, you see the time dependence here involves the frequency omega v of a certain vibrational mode. Okay, so it's different in general from the uh, the frequency of light. All right. Uh, just recalling that alpha is a tensor, is a is a is a second rank uh, symmetric tensor. Okay, the u and e are vectors and alpha is a polarizability tensor. Okay, so then you write your polarizability uh, in this fashion, and then you can do some algebra. So you can use the this equation right here, and substitute this expression for the polarizability so what you get is alpha 0 plus delta alpha cosine omega vt times ei cosine omega t and then you you can uh, write in this fashion this is equal to omega 0 
um, EI cosine omega t. So there is a term that oscillates with the same frequency of the incident radiation, the same frequency of the light. This is the induced dipole moment has a component oscillating in the same frequency of light. But then there's, there are other two components, so I can write the, the product of cosines as a linear combination of the sum and, and uh, the difference between frequencies. So, and, and the result is, is like that. You can verify that. I can, can write this as a cosine omega minus omega v t plus cosine omega plus omega v times t and multiplied by the incident field okay <clears throat> so you, you can see already that your induced uh, dipole in a molecule has three components this one as I said before oscillating with the same frequency of light this is associated to what we call Rayleigh scattering so and and other two frequencies in in which you subtract and and uh, you sum uh, to the frequency of light the frequency of uh, uh, vibrational mode this is uh, called the Stokes Raman scattering. Oops. Stokes component of the Raman scattering. And this is so the so called anti Stokes component. The, you, you, you can uh, realize this is a purely classical description so it's a it's a very approximate and simple description of the Raman scattering when you go to, to a quantum description and you do perturbation theory then you remember that the energy of the photon and the energy of the fault the phonon they are related to the frequency right so in this case you have a, a, a uh, oh, sorry, the, so th this is the oscillating dipole, right? When you have an oscillating dipole, it will emit radiation. So this describes the process of scattering. So the incident light has a frequency omega, and the scattered light has three frequencies. One is uh, the same frequency, which is called Rayleigh scattering, and the other two frequencies, uh, they are slightly smaller and slightly larger, than the incident frequency, which are called the Stokes and anti-Stokes scattering. And in terms of energy, when you remember that the frequency is related to, to, the, the, to the energy of a, a quantum particle in this fashion, then you can see that in this process, the, the, the photon is, is, is elastically scattered. It doesn't lose energy. Whereas in these other processes, it either loses or gains uh, energy. So this is associated to uh, uh, absorption of a phonon or a quantum of vibration. And this is associated with the emission. So that's the other way around, sorry. In this case, it's the emission of a phonon. And in this case, we have the absorption of a phone, right? And this summarizes the Raman scattering. So this, in this picture, you, you see what uh, experimentally uh, one typically does. You have an, an incident uh, light from a laser. and uh, incident on a, on a certain molecule and it can induce vibrations and you have Rayleigh and Raman scattering and uh, you have this 
very uh, intense Rayleigh line with the same frequency as the, the incident light and you have anti-Stokes and Stokes lights you usually have to put a filter here to, to filter the very strong Rayleigh scatterings so you'll be able to see the, the Stokes and anti-Stokes lines so this is a summary of how Raman scattering uh, works but let's see in terms of group theory what are the consequences of that so you see that the key quantity here is the polarizability, the Raman polarizability. So you forget about this term here, the Rayleigh scattering. If you think only about the Raman process, this is the, the, the key quantity. So uh, you have to look to the symmetry properties of the, the polarizability tensor, and, and that's the idea. So uh, I, I'm not going to do that because this, this is beyond the scope of this uh, course, but when you do a proper uh, formulation using quantum mechanics of, of the Raman process, uh, in the end you can write a perturbation Hamiltonian, which is called the, the Raman perturbation Hamiltonian, in, in which you have precisely this uh, change in the polarizability, and you have not only the incident, but also the scattered uh, field of the of the, the the light okay the incident and scattered electric fields so this is the Raman uh, uh, perturbation Hamiltonian to, to our concern here in this course we only care about the the transformation properties of this of how this quantity transform under the different symmetry operations of the group so, in a way, it's, it's, it's analogous to the case we have considered last time in which you had the infrared absorption uh, in, and then we wrote uh, the, the, the infrared Hamiltonian as simply the, the scalar product between induced dipole and electric field and we only cared about the transformation properties of the induced dipole which is a vector right and we we said that uh, uh to 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 look for selection rules of infrared absorption one would have to see how the vector transform according to different uh, irreducible representations of the group so we are going to do a similar thing here now but now you have a a a, a more complicated object which is not a vector but it it's a tensor so it's a second rank symmetric tensor with components uh, let's say delta alpha xx, xy, xz and uh, yx, yy, so on and so forth and uh, in analogy to what we did with the vector in which we had to look for basis functions of Cartesian coordinates x, y, z in this case we have to look in the character table where are the quadratic uh, basis functions x square, y square, z square, x, y, x, z, y, z. And this will be the recipe to identify uh, the different uh, <coughs> irreducible representations uh, that uh, are uh, relevant for the perturbation Hamiltonian of the Raman process. Okay? So then after doing that, we can analyze selection rules like that. You have an initial state and a final state, and they are coupled by the Raman perturbation Hamiltonian. And using the same arguments that we have done many times already uh, in the discussion of direct products, uh, we can conclude that this will be non-zero <coughs> only if... Uh, the 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 direct product of the representations gamma i of the initial state uh, and the representations of the Raman uh, uh, of the Raman uh, Hamiltonian will contain gamma f, which is the the representations of the final state. Okay, so and once again, typically one starts with 
the, with the initial state being the totally symmetric uh, uh, state, which is the same as saying that uh, I'm initially in the ground state of the system. So this is typically the, the, the totally symmetric or identity representation. So uh, basically then we have to, f to look at this uh, quantity to see if that contains the uh, representation for the final state. So we are going, we are going to see how this works in different examples. Um, so this is a general selection rule for Raman process. But just like we did uh, in the case of infrared uh, scattering, we can also uh, uh, try to figure out uh, information about the polarization. Okay. But notice now this is slightly more complicated than in the case of infrared absorption. In the case of infrared absorption, we had a vector, so we only we only had to see if the polarization of the electric field of incident light uh, uh, w was going to couple the, the initial and final state. But now in this case we have two vectors, is the incident and the scattered electric field. So uh, the polarization information for Raman scattering is slightly more complicated. It will involve analyzing the relative orientation of the incident and the scattered light okay so what so typically when I have uh, uh, basis functions for irreducible representations of this kind x square y square z square that means uh, selection rules for polarization of the incident field parallel to the scattered field, either in X, in Y, or Z. But when I uh, have basis functions of this kind, X, Y, X, Z, and Y, Z, so for those representations, uh, the, the Raman process will be active in the particular case of perpendicular polarization, when the incident field is perpendicular to the scattered field, either x, y, x, z, or y, z combinations of the incident and scattered radiation. And again, we are going to see that in several examples uh, in a minute. All right, so just um, another comment about parity. So when, when you have molecules with inversion symmetry, as we have seen before, the, the different irreducible representations, they can be uh, labeled in either uh, odd or even representations under inversion, right? And you, we have noticed already that the infrared absorption Hamiltonian, it's odd under parity because it transforms like the vector. So it will connect states of opposite parity, always, okay? But the Raman Hamiltonian, as you can see, the basis functions are even under uh, inversion. So Raman scattering will connect states of the same parity. So if I start, for instance, with the ground state, which is, is uh, it's even because it's a, it's a totally symmetric state. That means that the possible final states for infrared absorption will be odd states. And the possible final states for Raman scattered, scattering will be even. Okay? Uh, but remember, that's only the case when you have a molecule with inversion symmetry. When we do not have inversion symmetry, then this rule does not apply. And we will see a few examples of that as well. Okay, so let, let's start doing more examples. So until the end of this lecture, I'm going to analyze several different molecules. And we're going to start analyzing uh, linear molecules. The, these are the simpler systems that uh, one can uh, choose to look at. And the first example we are going to do is the carbon monoxide molecule, CO. 
this is the carbon monoxide molecule. I, I can choose the, C, the Z axis, the main symmetry axis along this, the, the symmetry axis of the molecule. And uh, one thing which is important for uh, linear molecules is that only rotations around X and Y, let's see, this is the, uh, for instance, the X and this is the Y axis, only those rotations are relevant that, and we need to subtract them uh, to calculate the, the vibrational uh, representations because you can consider the, the atoms as point-like objects so that the, the moment of inertia around uh, for rotations are around the z-axis is basically zero so they are not relevant and so uh, uh, as we're going to see uh, we can only uh, subtract we, we only have to subtract uh, representations associated to Rx and Ry when we discuss the vibrational modes of, of linear molecules. Okay, so let's start uh, analyzing the, the carbon monoxide molecule. Uh, this molecule belongs to the C infinite V uh, group. This is a semi infinite point group. It has this symmetry operations, identity, all possible rotations around the z-axis for any angle phi, and also it has uh, an infinite number of uh, sigma v operations, uh, vertical reflection planes. Okay, So uh, as we discussed last time, the first step is to calculate the characters of the equivalence representation atom sites and we see how many atoms are invariant when you apply these different symmetry operations and for this, the two atoms in the carbon monoxide molecule you can see that for all symmetry operations E, C, Phi or Sigma V all atoms remain invariant so we have two, two and two here okay so this is a reducible representation of the group and it's very easy to see this, this is just twice A1. It's just twice the, the, the identity representation. Okay. So this is the first step. Now the, the second step is we now calculate the, uh, the representation for molecular vibrations as we have learned in the previous lecture the representations the representation for molecular vibration we calculate first by doing the direct product between the equivalence representation and the vector representation and then we have to subtract the representations for translations and for rotations okay so Gamma atom sites, as we see, is a 2 times A1. And what is the vector representation? The vector representation, then we look in the character table. Z is right here, A A1, and XY is right here. Transforms like the 2D representation E1. So this is A1 plus E1. And we remember this comes from Z and this comes from x, y. Now we subtract again the vector, the translation. So we subtract a1 plus e1 and we subtract the rotations rx and ry. Rotations rx and ry are contained here. They are partners of the e1 representation. So we subtract once again e1. Okay, now uh, let so this cancels with the, the factor of two here. So in the end, we have a one plus e one minus e one, which is equal to a one. 
So this means that uh, uh, for the carbon monoxide molecule, we have only one vibrational mode, and this vibrational mode transforms like the identity representation A1. So it's not hard to figure out that the only possibility is like that. This is the A1 mode of CO. It's the only way you can make this molecule vibrate is by bond stretching uh, the bond between carbon and oxygen and it vibrates like that. Okay, that's the only possibility. So it's sort of a trivial example. But let's see if this mode is, is, is active for infrared and Raman. And you can see it is, right? Because you, you see the, the basis function Z here means that this is active, infrared active and for along Z, for polarization along Z. And uh, it's also Raman active because you see the quadratic functions here. X, Y, X square, Y square, Z square. So this is, pro this is also Raman active for, for parallel polarizations of of the incident and scattered fields okay so this molecule does not have inversion symmetry so we don't have to apply the the, the conditions that we have just discussed in the previous slide that uh, infrared connects to 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 odd uh, modes and the uh, Raman connects to even modes because in this case we don't have even or odd representations because this molecule does not have inversion symmetry. So let's see now a situation in which we do have that and that's the case of the oxygen molecule. The oxygen molecule uh, it's also a linear molecule we have just two oxygen atoms here O, O, this is an O2 molecule. And uh, it belongs to a different uh, point group, a different semi infinite point group, the infinite, D infinite AH point group. Okay. So, and uh, let's analyze the vibrational properties of the oxygen molecule. The first thing to do is to calculate. Uh, and let, let me do it right here. Let me, me calculate. Let me, let's calculate the characters of the uh, equivalent representation. And we have to look and see uh, uh, under the different symmetry operations of the group how many atoms are invariant. And uh, of course, for the identity, it's two. For C phi, it's also two. For C2 prime is zero, right? Because C2 prime rotation will take one oxygen atom to the other one and vice versa. And again, for the inversion is zero. And if you combine inversion and C phi, this is also zero. And for E C2 prime, this is again two. So these are the characters of the uh, uh, atom sites representation and we can just by in inspection look at the character table and you can figure out that this is just the sum this is just the sum of A1G plus A2U okay if you look at the characters and you can figure out that uh, this is precisely the case. It's just the sum of this representation and this one. All right, very good. So, what do we do now? Again, we calculate the irreducible representations for vibration states, vibrational modes, um, gamma atom sites, A1G plus a to u direct product with the vector representation vector is uh, a to u 
from z coordinate and uh, e1 u from x y coordinates this is c this is x y minus the translation so minus the vector representations again minus rotations around x and y so minus e1g okay all right so again uh, this guy cancels with this guy so we have a to u square which is a1g plus a to u times e1 u which is e1 g you can figure that out by the characters minus e1 g so the final result is a one mode one mode with a e a1 g symmetry once again it, it's it's a, it's the only possible mode uh, uh, is the stretching mode right so this is a bone stretching mode but in this particular case for this uh, molecule with inversion symmetry it's an even even under inversion so if you invert the, the this mode you see that the the vectors go into themselves so th this is even under inversion okay <coughs> Now let's analyze the, the, the infrared and Raman selection rules. You can see that this is not infrared active. Okay, you see Z is right here, X and Y are here. So this is not infrared. So if you do an infrared absorption on oxygen, you won't see anything. But it is Raman active. Now you see the quadratic functions right here uh, f for A1G. So it's not infrared active, but it is a Raman active mode. Okay. All right, very good. Next one. The next example is the C. O2 molecule. So the CO2 molecule have one carbon atom and two oxygen atoms in both sides. <coughs> it's a slightly more complicated molecule, but still a simple one. Again, it's the D infinite H group, and uh, so it's the same character table. Uh, so let's see how it works. So first of all, let's calculate the atom site representation. The atom site representations for identity, the characters are 3, uh, for C in phi is 3, for C2 prime, only the carbon atoms remain invariant, invariant so this is 1, the same for inversion, this is 1, um, this is 1, and this is 3 again. Okay, so these are the characters for the atom site or equivalence representation. So let's decompose that into irreducible representations of the group. So this is, uh, let's see, this is, um, uh, you can figure that out, this 2A1G plus A2U. So in this case now we have three vibrational modes with three different frequencies. So three non-degenerate vibrational frequencies. Two of them have A1G symmetry and the other one has A2U to U symmetry. Okay? Alright. Oh uh, no, so I'm so sorry. Now this is just the, the uh, atom site equivalence representation. 
So but now, the vibrational spectrum is, will be more complicated than that. So for, for the vibrational representation, this will be gamma equivalence times gamma vector minus gamma translation minus gamma rotation and this is 2a1g plus a2u times two translations are a2u 4z and e1u for xy minus translation minus rotation rotation is going to be uh, rz so minus a to g for rz and uh, e1g for rx ry so sorry we have to we we, we don't take into account RZ. So this is just RX where I RY. So this is just E one G. Okay. Good. So let's this is let's go ahead. Uh, this cancels with this factor of two and A one G times a two u is a two u, a one g times e one u is e one u, a two u times a two u is a one g, and uh, a two u times e one u is this is e one g minus e one g from the rotation. So finally, the three modes that we get. A1G plus A2U plus E1U. So in this case now we have, well, four vibrational modes. Two of them are non-degenerate, A1G and A to U and two modes double degenerate. So we have three different frequencies and and four vibrational modes. Okay. All right. So uh, let's see. Let's first. Let's see for. Okay. Let Let's look at how they look like. Uh, and of course, you can anticipate that the A one G mode is the breathing mode, right? It keeps the same the same symmetry of the original molecule. So this is the A1G mode of CO. So we have the carbon atom in the middle, not vibrating, and the, the two oxygen atoms vibrating uh, in opposite phase with respect to each other. Okay. So how about the the A2U? What should we expect from from physical Reasoning, uh, reasoning. So A to U, if you if if you look here, it transforms like Z. So it's odd under inversion and odd under C two prime. So one should expect a mode that has those properties. Okay, and uh, and this is the asymmetric stretch mode. So you can see that. Uh, the oxygen molecules vibrate in, in opposite phase with respect to the two sorry the carbon the carbon atom is vibrating with the opposite phase with respect to the two oxygen atoms okay if you apply the inversion you you see that this mode uh goes into minus itself so that's that's uh, kind of expected okay now what about the two e1 modes 
double degenerate vibration of frequency. Um, we have to we, we still need to look into bonding bond bending modes, right? These are all bond stretching modes. So um, we can also change the, the 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 angle between bonds, which is in this case is 180 degrees, and we can find a mode that uh, does precisely that. This is a a bond bending mode with polarization along I don't know x. Let's see. This is let's define. This is the x axis. This is the z axis, and uh, perpendicular to that we have the y axis. So this is a mode which is uh, uh, polarized along x. This is a bond bending mode. And of course you have a, a mode with displacements just perpendicular to this one with atoms vibrating along uh, the y direction. Right? Any linear combination of that would work. But this is the, the double degenerate E1 U mode of CO2. Okay. So what about um, infrared and Raman activity? So again, by looking at the character table, you see the infrared active modes uh, should be those uh, transforming like A2U and E1U. So both of those A to U it's and E one U, they are Raman active and uh, you can see the basis functions. This is uh, polarized along Z and this is polarized along uh, the XY plane. What about Raman? Let's see if the this even uh, mode A1G is Raman active and uh, indeed A1G is Raman active you can see the the quadratic uh, basis functions here x y y x square y square z square so this is uh, the A1G is Raman active for parallel polarization of the incident and scattered field <clears throat> All right. Next example. Now this is starting now to be more complicated. Let's do the C2H2 molecule. C2H2. Um, um, it's um, it's still a linear molecule. You have a two carbon atoms and two hydrogen atoms. This is uh, once again the D infinite age group. Uh, we can calculate the equivalence representation and this is 4, this is 4, this is 0, 0, this is 0 and this is 4. Okay. And uh, you see that this is this decomposes into the sum of twice A1G plus twice A2U. <coughs> All right. Okay. So let's uh, calculate the vibrational representation, gamma vibration. is the equivalence representations 2A1G plus 2A2U direct product with the vector representation which is in this case A2U plus E1U and then I have to subtract the translation which is again the vector representation A2U plus E1U and Rx and Ry rotations, which in this case are E1G. Okay, so 
this guy cancels with this two and we have a two u plus e one u plus two a one g plus now I have the product plus two e one g this is the product of a to u and e one u minus e one g so finally then we have in this case seven different modes you have two completely symmetric modes a one g one non-degenerate odd mode a to u and two doubly degenerate modes e one u which is odd and e one g which is even on the parity okay seven modes okay now this is harder now to figure out which are the modes displacement uh, one can do that using the projection technique that we have discussed before I'm not going to do that uh, I'm, I'm just going to present and discuss that they look reasonable uh, so and these are then the the different modes so these are the two <coughs> uh, totally symmetric E1G modes uh, it's a uh, with a frequency omega 1 and omega 2 both are breathing modes so both do not change the, the symmetry of the molecule but in one case you can see that I'm stretching primarily the C2 the carbon carbon bond and in the other case I'm stretching both the carbon carbon bond and the carbon hydrogen bond so this is expected to be higher frequency or higher energy than this other one okay these are different a1g modes okay so what about the a2u mode so it should be odd under inversion so one could one must have uh, this situation here so the two carbon atoms moving in the opposite uh, phase with respect to the two hydrogen atoms. If you do inversion here you see that you get a minus sign. So this is the A2U mode. And the A1G and A so the E1G and E1U modes are both bending modes but one is even, this one is even under parity and this one is odd under parity. Okay. okay so these are the different modes so uh, how about infrared and Raman activity um, infrared active modes should be along Z a to U and along XY E1U and Raman active modes should be um, A1G so you see in this case A1G we have a parallel polarization and E1G you see here E1G it has cross polarization XZ and YZ right so the E1G mode is also Raman active and you can prove that in the situation of perpendicular polarization of light of the incident with respect to the 
a scattered electric field. Okay? Very good. So let's go now to three-dimensional molecules and we start with the ammonia molecule, NH3 molecule. Okay? So the NH3 molecule, uh, we, sh we see it right there, and uh, it belongs to, it transforms like the C3V point group. The C3V point group, this is the character table, has only three classes, identity, the, the two C3 rotations, and three reflections, vertical reflections, three sigma V operations. Okay. And uh, these are the character table, these are the three uh, irreducible representations. So let's calculate. Uh, this is uh, the calculated equivalence representation right here. For the identity, uh, all atoms remain invariant. For the two C3 operations, only the central nitrogen atom remains invariant. And for the three C sigma V operations, two atoms, one, one nitrogen and one hydrogen, remain invariant. So this is a, the four, one, two characters. When you decompose into irreducible representations of the group, you have 2A1 plus E. Okay? You, you, you could do also the uh, atom site rep characters for hydrogen only, and it would look like that. We have done that already. And you, you basically add 1, 1, 1 to get this equivalence representation, because for all symmetry operations, the nitrogen atom do, do not, does not move. Okay? Okay, so let's go ahead and calculate the vibrational, the symmetries of the vibrational modes for ammonia. So, gamma vibration is <coughs> gamma equivalence pro direct product with vector minus gamma translations minus gamma rotations. In this case, we have a three-dimensional molecule, so we have to subtract three rotations. Rotation around X, around Y, and around Z. Okay? So, this is uh, 2A1 plus E. This is the equivalence representation times the vector. The vector is A1 plus E minus translation, which is again the vector, minus the three rotations. Rotations are A2 for RZ and also E for R RX, RY. Very good. So this is uh, cancels with the 2 here. So this is equal to <coughs> A1 plus E plus E plus so E times E it's a four dimensional representation with characters 4, 1, 0 you can check that this is equal to A1 plus A2 plus E Okay, minus A2 minus E. So, in the end, you have uh, 2A1 plus 2E. You have two non-degenerate frequencies and two double-degenerate or two-fold degenerate uh, frequencies for the ammonia molecule. All right, so let's check the infrared and Raman activity. Infrared, you see right here that uh, for Z polarization, the A1 mode should be active, and for XY polarization, the E modes should be active. So all modes are active.
for infrared absorption so the the e1 modes for z polarization and the e modes for xy polarization or about raman again for raman all modes are also active because you have quadratic functions here for the a1 mode this is for parallel polarization and for perpendicular polarization you have also quadratic functions here x y sorry x z y z okay so then we have a1 parallel and uh, e for perpendicular polarization so you see that in this case you would measure <clears throat> uh, you can use either infrared absorption or Raman scattering to, to measure all the different vibrational frequencies of these uh, a molecule okay <clears throat> this is the mostly this happens when the molecule has a, a, a smaller number of symmetry operations it's a it's a low symmetry group so and in the, when that happens it it's more likely that you be able to measure uh, a single mode either with the uh, infrared experiment or with the Raman experimental technique okay <coughs> okay so now let's try to figure out the mode displacements let's start with the simple ones which are the two a1 modes the totally symmetric modes okay um, and you, you you can think of uh, displacements along the plane or and perpendicular to the plane x y or or z although as we're going to see in the end we will have actually to mix them to get the real modes but it's a good starting point so let's see how one can uh, make displacements that keep the molecule invariant okay and of course uh, th these are different uh, breathing modes you can have an, an in-plane breathing mode <coughs> like that so all the the hydrogen atoms moving uh, radially to the center of this triangle but you can uh, and of course uh, you have to remember that for all vibrational modes the molecule is not translating nor rotating the center of mass must remain invariant so the the molecule is not translating and also it doesn't uh, uh, have any rotation so uh, for any mode uh, uh, it's easier to, to 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 draw only the displacements of the hydrogen atoms but you have to think that the nitrogen atom is responding to to this uh, movement of the hydrogen atoms in a way to cancel all the, the translation of the center of mass and all the rotations of the molecule okay so this is a possible a1 in plane breathing mode you can also have a, a1 out of plane of z axis breathing mode in which the molecule the, the three hydrogen molecules move up and the nitrogen molecule moves down so it, it's ro is vibrating like that okay this again this does not change the, the 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 symmetry of the molecule so it's a one a, a perfectly valid a1 mode now <clears throat> just like in the case uh, uh, that we studied for electronic states also for vibrational modes when you have two modes of the same symmetry like in this case both modes have a1 symmetry they can mix they can couple 
So the real solution to this problem we cannot anticipate from group theory. One would have, in principle, to diagonalize the matrix of force constants to get those modes. Okay, so I'm just going to show you the answer. When you do that, what you get is something more like this guy, which is a bone stretching, not in plane, but in the direction of the bones. You see that the, the, the hydrogen atoms are stretching the NH bones. So, so this is a, is not a planar molecule, so they are not actually vibrating totally in the plane, but they have some smaller Z component as well, okay? So it's actually a linear combination of these two modes, but you, you cannot get this from group theory. So this is again a perfectly valid A1 mode. And the other mode is this other guy right here, which is not tot is almost is almost out of plane z mode but not quite you see there's an angle here so this is a more like a bending mode so this is a bone stretching and this is a bone bending mode and as expected the, the bone stretching mode is higher frequency than the bone bending mode because it, it, it requires a more energy to to stretch a bone than to bend it okay but these two modes are two linear combinations of uh, in-plane and out-of-plane vibrational modes. And these are the solutions that one would get. Uh, this is probably uh, experimental and theoretical values for each one of those. <clears throat> this, is probably, this is the solutions that one would get by, by calculating uh, these modes using the, the method of diagonalization of the Hessian matrix, the force constant matrix. Okay, these are the two A1 modes. So how about the two E modes? These are more complicated. And to analyze that, let's recall the discussion we had last time about the normal modes of an equilateral triangle. If you remember, we have discussed this last time. <clears throat> and uh, we also had a, a one mode, uh, a breathing mode, and we had the E mode in that case. And I have calculated that using projection operators, and I want to draw that again because what what I did last time was not totally correct. If you remember the conclusion I got using uh, projection operators, I started I started projecting projecting a, a initial function which was a vertical displacement on this guy radial displacement and uh, when I projected I, I got twice smaller radial displacement on the other two atoms if you remember that that's what we did in the previous lecture last time okay but this is again not totally correct to correct because if, if you can see that if I if I have these displacements in a triangle, the center of mass is moving upwards. If you see there is a net displacement of the center of mass moving this direction. And for the case of the triangle, I would have to correct for that. So uh, if I subtract the displacement of the center of mass, uh, I would have actually something like that. A smaller, a smaller displacement here. And this guy would be like that. This guy would be like that. So this is a the the correct solution of the the problem that I, I posed last time. Uh, and so this is one of the partners of the E E mode of the triangle. And the other partner you would get just by making a, a, a orthogonal mode to this one. So these are the results. Uh, this is the symmetric stretch for the triangle. And these are the two bending modes, the generate bending modes. This guy is just this one, right? 
and the, this other guy you get by by uh, doing a 90 degrees rotation in each of in each of these uh, arrows here so you get a, a uh, a mold that is orthogonal to the, the first one and uh, it looks like that okay so what I'm doing here is just uh, redoing the, the discussion I did on the triangle because this is going to be important now so what about the uh, ammonia molecule so one way to, to, to think about this E modes, if you remember our discussion on the linear combination of, of S orbitals of an equilateral triangle and how one could construct a basis set uh, of uh, a linear combination of S orbitals that transforms like the E representation in a triangle, you remember that you had something like that. Okay, so uh, displacement or in this in, in that case it was an s orbitals in this case it is going to be displacement but this is very schematic displacement on a hydrogen 1 atom on a hydrogen 2 and hydrogen 3 atoms and there is also a phase factor one can introduce a phase factor of a 2 pi over 3 uh, uh, from I1 with H1 with respect to H2 and H2 with respect to H3. Okay. Uh, if you use that an, uh, as an inspiration, and you see that this is precisely what we get here. If if I draw these three displacements in a complex plane or in an XY plane, in this case it's the same thing. I have precisely one vector right here. Let's say this is this is one, and then I I, I rotate with uh, this this other vectors right here, and this other vector. We have three vectors which have an angle of two pi over three between them, and they sum up to zero. Okay. So in this case it's guaranteed that the center of mass does not move. So and I can do that or I can do that like that. This another possibility orthogonal to that one is to do like this, which is precisely the, the other partner. Okay. So that's what the book means when when it draws something like that h omega h omega h omega square h it means there is a phase difference between the displacements of uh, atoms 1 2 and 3 but this phase difference you have have to think about it as orientations in the in the complex plane in this case interpreted as the XY plane so it's not like a phase difference in time so the atoms are vibrating all in the same direction and you have a phase difference in time it's a phase difference in the complex plane translated to the XY plane so and this gives us the correct directions of displacements for normal modes in these two different combinations okay so this is going to be one of the e1 modes that let let's call it let's call it in plane e mode uh, but uh, again we are going to see that in plane and out of plane with the same symmetry e they are going to mix but let's start with that let's start with an in plane mode and uh, when you do the calculations this is what you get so you get something that actually again looks like more uh, kind of a uh, has the same pattern that we discussed. You see this is sometimes it's not so easy to see, but you see that this guy right here, this this particular partner here, it looks a lot 
like this one. I hope you agree. Okay. And this part partner, it looks a lot like this one. Okay. All right. So this is what I would call um, an, an uh, in-plane E mode. And when you do the calculations, this is what we get. It's not perfectly in plane, as you see, there's some out of plane components because it mixes with the out of plane mode that we are going to discuss now. So what about the out of plane mode? So in this case, it's, it's not very convenient to use this uh, uh, analogy with the uh, uh, complex plane because now uh, the out of plane modes it vi the, in, in principle, if it's perfectly out of, out of plane, it's vibrating only in the Z direction, okay? So in this case, it's, uh, it, it's, it's easier to uh, start our discussion with this other choice of basis that we have also discussed the, it when we discussed the uh, electronic uh, molecular states of ammonia. Uh, it's an, another. It's a linear combination of of uh, the the original complex uh, combination of s orbitals. But this is a real combination. If you, you can go back to chapter seven and and uh, uh, revisit that discussion if you want. But the idea is that uh, this guy. This this particular atom moves up by uh, with an amplitude of two, and these other two atoms they move down with amplitudes of minus one and minus one. And uh, this guy is an amplitude zero, and this is plus one minus one, up and down. Now here you have to be careful because. <coughs> Although the center of mass of these guys are not moving, there is a rotation. If you think about it, there is a rotation when I when I make this displacement. So again, the nitrogen atom has to respond to this movement. So the nitrogen atom is not fixed. It, ha it has to respond to this movement to cancel all this, this rotation. So it's, it's, a, it's a more complicated mode. But that's the idea. <coughs> So when you do the actual calculations, this is what you get, okay? Uh, and once again, this is very similar to, to what I have drawn before. You see this, this guy is not moving, and this guy is moving opposite, one up and one down. So this guy is very similar to this one. And this, in this other case, it has a larger amplitude in one in in uh, downwards and the other two atoms has a, uh, a smaller amplitude upwards okay <clears throat> and once again this is not perfectly out of plane but uh, because it mixes with the other in plane mode that i discussed in the previous slide okay so i hope you get the idea this the discussion starts to be more complicated when you have more complicated molecules and let's finish this chapter uh, by discussing the ch4 molecule which is a very symmetric molecule the tetrahedral td group <coughs> it has one carbon atom right in the middle of the tetrahedron and four uh, hydrogen atoms around it. <coughs> this is the character table. Uh, it has many symmetry operations, the identity, C3 rotations, C2 rotations, a reflection plane, sigma D, and improper rotations, S4. Uh, so let's start by uh, writing the Equivalence representation. I have five atoms uh, for the identity, they are all invariant. For C3, C3 is an axis that goes through the carbon and one of the hydrogens. So 
these two atoms remain unchanged and the other ones move so this is two right here C2 for C2 uh, only only the the central carbon atom is an invariant so this is one and for Sigma D for Sigma D three atoms the carbon and two of the hydrogen atoms are invariant so this is three and for S4 only the carbon atom is invariant so this is one so and uh, you can decompose into irreducible representations of the group I uh, will let you figure that out but the, the final answer is 2A1 plus T2 so okay so let's calculate let's calculate the vibration representation as usual <clears throat> so then this is 2a1 plus t2 direct product with translation so let's see uh, this is xyz they're all in the same uh, three-dimensional representation T2 so this is T2 here minus T2 for translations minus the three rotations are in T1 minus T1 this cancels with the, this 2 here so this is then um, T2 plus the direct product of T2 and T2 uh, let me uh, uh, do that in a minute minus T1 so if I look at the characters of T2 times T2 for identity for HC3 for 3C2 for um, 6 sigma d and for 6 s4 I, it's basically the square of t2 so it's like 9 0 1 1 1 and then I have to decompose this into reducible representations and after spending a while looking at it you'll be able to figure out or you can do the, the composition formula but this is uh, a1 plus E plus T1 plus T2 you can check that if uh, you can check that this is correct okay all right very good so in the end I have uh, the vibrational representation will be A1 plus E plus twice T2 so this molecule has two uh, three frequencies sorry four frequencies one of them is non-degenerate one of them it's doubled two-fold degenerate and two of them are three-fold degenerate okay so let's check the Raman and infrared activity so which one uh, so which one is uh, which ones are infrared you see that the the vector is only here at t2 so only the t2 modes are infrared active the a1 and the e mode are uh, modes are not infrared active okay how about uh, uh, Raman activity so first of all e there is a, a small mistake in this table in the book this is the this is in the appendix of uh, our textbook and actually this is incorrect the, the X the X, uh, X Z X Y and Y Z 
functions, they do not belong to T1, but they actually belong to the T2, <coughs> okay? To the T2 representation. I have checked that information uh, online and other character tables, they, they are correct. So, okay, so when you, when, you, when you account for that small mistake, you figure out that for the A1, the A1, both the A1 and the E modes, they both have quadratic functions. And also the T2 modes, the T2 modes, it has quadratic functions with cross polarization. Okay, so all these three modes, the sorry, all these modes are Raman active. Okay, so for Raman activity, we have uh, A1 and E with parallel polarization of the incident and scattered field, and for the T, the two T modes the two T2 modes, they are also Raman active at perpendicular polarization. All right, finally, in principle, one would have to figure out what are the uh, mode displacements, but in this case, it's very complicated. So I'm just going to give you the answer. And uh, <clears throat> of course, you can see that uh, some some of these one would be able to guess. Uh, we, we always have a, a A1 breathing mode, but the other modes are not so easy to, to, to get. Uh, if you want, there is a reference, reference 40 in, in our textbook. And uh, in this book, uh, they have uh, mode displacements, infrared and Raman activity of several of those simple polyatomic molecules. So it's a good reference book to have and to look at. So uh, this uh, different displacements for A1, for E, and for the two T2 modes, one right here and the other right here, this was taken from this book. Okay. All right, very good. So this is the end of chapter, chapter 8. There's a... a Another smaller part of chapter 8 in discussing uh, uh, rotations of molecules that I'm not going to, to uh, uh, discuss that with you. Uh, uh, vibrations are more, slightly more important. Uh, so I, I will finish that now. And this is the problem set 8. It has three problems. And this is uh, due on next uh, Wednesday, May 6th. Okay? Thank you.